substance use, addiction, and safe opioid prescribing in adolescents. Hi, I'm Sharon Levy, and this presentation is on pain management and specifically safe opioid prescribing practices. I'm the director of the Adolescent Substance Abuse Program here at Boston Children's Hospital and also a developmental pediatrician. The objectives of this presentation are to review the epidemiology of opioid misuse, abuse, and dependence, to review opioid neurobiology, to illustrate safe opioid prescribing practices, to highlight the differences between addiction and what we sometimes call pseudo-addiction, and to review special considerations when treating patients with pain and a history of substance abuse or dependence. Epidemiology of Opioid Misuse and Abuse this slide shows data from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Data was collected between 2002 and 2009, and it shows trends in uh, misuse of opioid medication among adolescents. As you can see from the graph, uh, there's been significant increase in the uh, number of uh, adolescents who've misused opioids between 2002 and 2009, and these numbers continue to grow. This increase is, has been in conjunction with the development of newer and stronger pain medications. Adolescents' recreational use of prescription painkillers accounted for more than 17% of all illicit drug use initiations in 2009. That means uh, more adolescents started their drug use histories by using an opioid than any other drug other than marijuana. Uh, in 2009, one in eight, or about 13% of high school seniors had misused a prescription opioid medication, meaning they'd used it either recreationally or for non-medical use sometime in their lifetime. And we know that many adolescents are misusing uh, prescription medications because they believe that they are safe because they're prescribed by a physician. This graph shows lifetime misuse of opioid among 12th graders in high school. Uh, this is from the Monitoring the Future study, which uh, surveys adolescents in 8th, 10th, and 12th grades in a nationally representative sample. And we can see that from 1991 uh, through 2011, there was a dramatic uh, increase in misuse of opioids. So uh, this slide shows reasons adolescents endorse for misusing pain medication. We've grouped the reasons into three major categories. In blue, adolescents have suggested that these medications are easy to get. In green, adolescents are telling us that they have less of a problem if they're caught with these medications as opposed to other drugs. And in pink, uh, we have reasons suggesting that adolescents believe that these medications are safer to use uh, than illegal drugs or street drugs. From 2008 to 2009, there was a big increase in perceived availability in almost all of the categories that we asked about. Um, however, the trend uh, started moving down between 2008 and 2010, suggesting that uh, some of the public health uh, campaign on uh, uh, to uh, decreasing the problem towards misuse of opioid medication had started paying off. However, as you can see, even in the 2010 column, uh, availability of prescription uh, opioid pain medication is still unacceptably high for adolescents. Risks of long-term opioid exposure. Opioid medications exert their action on the mu opioid receptor. This graphic demonstrates areas of high mu opioid receptor density in the central nervous system. The four primary areas that have high mu opioid receptor density uh, are shown in colored blocks. The first block is the prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for executive functions such as controlling impulsivity. In green, we see the limbic system, which includes the nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area. Uh, this part of the brain is important for pleasure and reward, and is also very important in the uh, development of addictions. The area in orange is the brain stem, which is responsible for autonomic functions such as respiration. The area shown in yellow is the spinal cord, which is responsible for analgesia. Opioid binding has distinct physiologic functions in the different regions. The receptor density is very dynamic. Therefore, an individual who has pain can tolerate a large dose of opioids, which will primarily bind in the spinal cord after an injury. However, the same individual may overdose on exactly the same dose of opioids when he or she is no longer in pain. Spinal cord receptors are not as available, and binding happens uh, in other areas of the brain. Pain medication always needs to be titrated to effect, in other words, to reach pain control and kept at the lowest dose possible to minimize opioid-induced euphoria and binding to other areas in the brain. 
There are some uh, important physiologic adaptations to uh, prolonged use of opioids. The first one is called tolerance, and that refers to the need for increasing amounts of substance to achieve a desired effect. A second physiologic adaptation is called withdrawal, and this is a physiologic response to a rapid decline in receptor binding due to either rapidly decreasing concentrations of opioids or the presence of a blocking agent. These two physiologic adaptations will occur whenever an individual has prolonged exposure and, uh, and then withdrawal to opioids. When we're talking about opioid addiction, we're talking to a loss of control or compulsive use of opioids. Tolerance and withdrawal are both criteria for diagnosis of opioid dependence, but they're neither necessary nor sufficient to make the diagnosis alone. Other criteria, such as persistent desire or, uh, to use the drug or unsuccessful efforts to cut down uh, or control use, a great deal of time spent obtaining, using, or recovering from effects, and giving up important activities um, because of drug use, or continued use of a drug despite physical or psychological harm are also important criteria. Any patient uh, exposed to opioids over a long period of time, including patients who are prescribed opioids for pain and are using uh, the medications as prescribed, will develop tolerance and withdrawal if the drug is stopped abruptly. Uh, these are uh, a normal physiologic adaptation and uh, do not in and of themselves define addiction. This slide shows an overview of treatment for opioid dependence. On the left, we have non-pharmacological treatments. Uh, such as uh, residential treatment, which means removing an individual from his uh, home setting, placing him in a hospital or other treatment program uh, where uh, the cues and triggers to use opioids would be less. Can, uh, also in this column, they can see a variety of outpatient treatments, such as in intensive outpatient or partial uh, hospital treatment, 12-step fellowships, such as Alcoholics Anonymous or uh, Narcotics Anonymous, sometimes referred to as AA or NA, um, individual or group therapy, family therapy, and therapeutic schools or communities. On the right, we have pharmacological treatments. Um, so detoxification is often the first step for patients who are, have become opioid dependent and present in withdrawal. Detoxification can be done with methadone, buprenorphine, clonidine, or other medications that are sometimes referred to as comfort medications. It should be noted, though, that detoxification is not considered definitive treatment. It's only the first step for uh, an individual who needs to enter treatment. Um, opioid antagonism can be given uh, uh, long term. Um, and naltrexone is available to be given either orally or IM. Um, we can also give replacement therapy with either methadone or buprenorphine, and these can all be combined with non-pharmacological treatments. Safe Opioid Prescribing Practices In terms of long-term opioid prescribing, and now we're talking about chronic non-malignant pain, so a patient who um, has a need for ongoing pain treatment but does not have a life-threatening uh, condition. For these patients, opioid prescriptions should always be written by one doctor and, filmed, uh, and filled at one pharmacy. Treatment should be coordinated with other providers. Uh, we recommend that physicians use their state's prescription monitoring program when they're available. Uh, stable patients should be seen at least quarterly for an evaluation, and uh, physicians should consider drug testing to monitor for compliance to make sure that the prescribed drug is, is uh, present in the urine and uh, to make sure that illicit drugs are not uh, in the urine. Principles of pain control. We know that opioids are the most effective analgesics available, but they're also some of the most addictive substances uh, available. However, with careful monitoring, opioids can be prescribed safely to patients who have pain. A few key principles uh, regarding safe opioid prescribing practices. First, set reasonable expectations and treatment goals with patients. Second, maximize non-pharmacological interventions such as splinting, physical therapy, relaxation therapy, uh, and other such treatments. Third, use combination therapy to balance pain relief and side effects. Fourth, start low and go slow. Use PR and medications for breakthrough pain in order to provide adequate pain control until a uh, therapeutic dose is established. Advise patients and parents of uh, child and adolescent patients on the appropriate use of PR and medications. Keep prescriptions small. Assess patients frequently to monitor for pain and signs of opioid euphoria. Case studies. Case one. First case is an individual who presents uh, with 
need for management of uh, chronic non-malignant pain, um, and uh, the doctor has to decide if this uh, young woman has become uh, addicted or uh, has uh, poor pain control. So Lisa is a 15-year-old athlete with spondylysis. She failed conservative management with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. She's wearing a back brace and surgery is planned in six months. Her orthopedic has prescribed acetaminophen with codeine for her back pain. And she's come to you, her primary care physician, saying that she continues to have pain despite her medication. So you interview Lisa privately. She denies past year use of alcohol, marijuana, and other drugs. She's never misused, sold, or shared her prescription pain medication or bought pain medication illicitly. And the remainder of her history and physical exam are largely unremarkable. This is a triage guide to help thinking about which patients can be treated safely in primary care um, and which ones need to be either uh, monitored or uh, referred uh, to uh, an, another professional. So uh, we recommend that patients who are in the low risk category, so no use of psychoactive substances, can be treated and monitored safely in primary care. We call patients who have relatively lower risk of alcohol and or marijuana use only as established by a standard screen such as the NIAAA Youth Alcohol Screening Guide or the Craft Questions may be treated in primary care but should be monitored closely and we recommend consultation with either a mental health or addiction specialist when managing these patients over time. Patients who have higher risk alcohol and or uh, marijuana use or use of other illicit substances should fall into the high risk category. These patients should be stabilized in primary care but then co-managed with either a mental health or addiction specialist. The Craft Screening Tool is a behavioral health screening tool for use with children under the age of 21 and is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse for use with adolescents. It consists of a series of six questions developed to screen adolescents for high-risk alcohol and other drug use disorders simultaneously. It's a short, effective screening tool meant to assess whether a longer conversation about the context of use frequency and other risks and consequences of alcohol and other drug use is warranted. The craft screening tool may be self-administered, that is given to the adolescent prior to the visit or may be administered live by the clinician during the visit. Live screening using the craft begins by asking the adolescent to please answer these next questions honestly, telling him or her that the answers will be kept confidential then asking three opening questions described in Part A of the CRAFT screening tool. If the adolescent answers no to all three opening questions, the provider only needs to ask the adolescent the first question, the CAR question. If the adolescent answers yes to any one or more of the three opening questions, the provider asks all six CRAFT questions listed in Part B of the screening tool. CRAFT is a mnemonic acronym of the first letters of keywords in the six screening questions. The questions should be asked exactly as written. C. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? R. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in? A. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you are by yourself, alone? F. Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? F. Do your friends or family ever tell you you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? T. Have you gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? So in this presentation, you assess Lisa as low risk for misusing her opioids. You agree to give her a one-week trial of oxycodone, including 5 mg PRN dose. Lisa's mother agrees to monitor the medication. You give her a sp small prescription and ask her to come back in one week. Follow-up one week later, Lisa's still complaining of back pain. She reports taking all the medication that her mother gave to her. She says her pain is 10 out of 10, and she's asking for more medication. So what do you do at this point? You meet with Lisa's mother privately to ask her how, how she thinks Lisa is doing at home. During your interview, she confides in you that she's worried about Lisa becoming addicted to opioids because she knows how, how addictive these medications are. 
and so she's been withholding some of the medication. You go back in and explain that pain can be treated safely with good monitoring. You answer Lisa's mother's questions about tolerance, withdrawal, and explain to her the difference between tolerance and withdrawal alone and addiction. You ask her to give Lisa the medications as prescribed, and you review with both Lisa and her mother when a PRN dose would be indicated. You give them a one-week prescription and ask them to follow up in one week's time. At follow-up, Lisa's mother has given her medication as prescribed. Her pain and mood are much better at the next visit. Lisa complains of constipation, and you discuss management. It, it, she reports that she took PRN doses on only two occasions, on days when she was more active than usual. You all agree that she seems to be on the correct medication regimen. You refill her prescription for two weeks and ask her to come for another follow-up. So in this case, Lisa has many indications that she has uh, poor pain control, which is sometimes referred to pseudo-addiction. Uh, this chart shows us suggestions of when a patient has poor pain control as opposed to when they have true addiction. As you can see, a patient with poor pain control, once the uh, medication regimen has been achieved, uh, medication use will be stable, as opposed to patients with addiction who will constantly escalate their medication dose. You can see that functioning uh, improves when a patient with poor pain control is put on the correct dose. However, in addiction, the more the dose of medication uh, uh, rises, the worse the symptoms of addiction become. Patients with poor pain control are often concerned about side effects. Patients with addiction typically do not complain about side effects. Patients with poor pain control will often have leftover med medications, uh, where patients with addiction rarely will. Uh, patients with poor uh, pain control are not typically preoccupied with opioid medications once pain is adequately controlled. Patients with addiction, however, remain preoccupied by medication. In fact, it's one of the criteria for making a diagnosis of opioid addiction um, is this loss of control and preoccupation. Here's some anticipatory guidance that we recommend that you give all patients who will be prescribed pain medications. So for, uh, first of all, we recommend that you use an opioid contract for all patients on long-term medication. The contract should spell out uh, the, uh, what you expect of the patients, their parents, and what they should expect of you. Patients should never change the dose or frequency of their medication without uh, consulting with their physician. We recommend that parents hold on to all medication and supervise uh, dosing, um, particularly for uh, children and younger adolescents. Um, we recommend that physicians uh, discuss with both patient and parent the significant misuse potential of these medications. Um, should also review the policies regarding early refills for lost or stolen prescriptions. Other signs of true addiction are patients who give an evasive history, frequent requests for early refills or unscheduled visits to the office or emergency room looking for medications, patients who sell their medications uh, or forge prescriptions uh, uh, often uh, have addiction, patients who steal or buy prescriptions from non-medical sources, um, anyone who injects drugs or takes them other than as prescribed, uh, uh, for example, by insufflating them nasally or snorting them, or patients who mix drugs and alcohol um, are all uh, more likely to have addiction. Case studies, case two. Case two is a, a patient with acute self-limited pain. Julie is a 17-year-old girl who has been followed in your office since infancy. She's healthy with no significant past medical history. She now presents with pain after inverting her ankle during a cheerleading practice several hours ago. She has diffuse swelling and tenderness of her right ankle. Her range of motion is normal and there's no point to tenderness. An x-ray reveals soft tissue swelling but no fracture. You wrap Julie's ankle in an ACE bandage and teach her how to use crutches. You advise her to rest, ice, compress, and elevate the injured ankle and ad-lib with weight-bearing but uh, avoid cheerleading practice and physical education for the next week. And you prescribe her ibuprofen 400 milligrams every six hours for pain. At follow-up, Julie returns a, a few days later complaining that she is still uncomfortable. Concerned by her prolonged pain, you ask the radiologist to review the x-ray. He confirms the reading of soft tissue swelling exam of her ankle is now unremarkable. You recommend that she continue ibuprofen and add acetaminophen for pain and you refer her to an orthopedist. She asks you for stronger pain medication, saying that her friend gave her some pills the other day that made her feel much better. What do you do next? At this point, you say the following to Julie. 
I know that ankle sprains can be very uncomfortable. The good news is that your x-ray confirmed that you don't have a fracture or something more serious. I don't think the medication you asked for is the right thing in this situation. Opioid pain medications have a lot of side effects and can be harmful. Since you're still uncomfortable, I would like you to see the orthopedist just to make sure that we're not missing anything. Here are some principles of managing acute self-limited pain. So number one, use non-pharmacological treatments uh, and or non-narcotics first. Number two, if opioids are necessary, give a small supply, such as two to four days. Number three, inform parents and patients about any narcotic medications uh, that will be given and their uh, abuse and misuse potential. Number four, discuss the risk of abuse, addiction, and diversion. Number five, advise parents and patients to discard any leftover medication. Case studies, case three. Case number three is acute self-limited pain in a patient with opioid dependence. Eric is a 17-year-old boy who was diagnosed with opioid dependence and started on opioid replacement therapy with buprenorphine 18 months ago. With a combination of medications, individual therapy, and AA meetings, Eric has done very well. He's a senior in high school and has been abstinent for, from all substances for over a year. Eric broke his tibia in a skiing injury eight days ago. In the emergency department, he was advised to stop his buprenorphine temporarily and treated with Percocet for pain. He's come into the office because he continues to have pain at night and he recently ran out of medication. Uh, this case is to illustrate that pain can be treated safely in patients with opioid dependence. However, primary care physicians should always coordinate with other providers and agree on a single prescriber. Um, we also recommend that anybody prescribing opioid pain medication to a patient with known opioid dependence should speak with the collaborating treaters. In this case, this would uh, uh, include Eric's counselor um, and his uh, buprenorphine provider. We recommend uh, increasing supportive care such as counseling visits and AA meetings during the time while uh, patients will be receiving opioid pain medication uh, because uh, uh, taking opioids can be triggering even for patients who've been in a stable recovery over a long period of time. Of course, all the proper consents will be need, need to be in place before uh, speaking to uh, collaborating treaters. We also recommend uh, in patients uh, who've had a uh, history of opioid addiction to monitor uh, with drug testing to ensure the presence of the expected substance and the absence of others. In summary, opioid medication can be used safely to treat pain without putting patients at risk of developing uh, addiction. Use caution when prescribing pain medications to adolescents. Use extra caution when prescribing to adolescents with a history of a substance use disorder and consider inadequately treated pain if a patient hoards medication or escalates the dose on his or her own.